There's now two questions which I both want to read to you because they're basically almost the same thing, but one is coming from LinkedIn, the other one is from Hubido. What do you think about the use and role of AI and code development, especially in C++? And let me layer over LinkedIn. Uh, how do you see the future of tools and AI extensions which do generate the code and also programmers in the very long run? Okay, yeah, this is a this is an interesting topic and one that um, I, I I managed to find a quote from myself in a talk I gave in Poland in 2016, where I, I was asked a very similar question. And obviously, the the world in 2016, from the point of view of um, code based generative AI, is very different to the world in 2023. At that point, we were saying, what might happen in the future? Well, we're, now we're in the future. And, and my key observation was. Um, you've still got a job. Well done. Um, but you better be testing. Um, you need to get better at asking questions. You need to get better at un uh, understanding what it is that you want. You or your eye also needs to get better at being able to discriminate a good solution from a bad solution. Um, being able to generate code is wonderful at one level, except when it doesn't work and you need to know that it doesn't work. And what we're going to find is that a lot of people are going to use AI-related uh, tools. They're going to use a lot of you know, generative AI to generate code. And a lot of that code is going to be not quite right. Um, uh, and they won't know it because they won't test. In other words, what we're going to find is that in future, there will be the people that remember to test their code and already are good at testing, but they're also good at specifying their problem and immediately recognizing if what they're getting is not quite right. And then we're going to have a lot of people who are going to use this just like any other tool, and they're not going to do that. And they are going to create what we like to call legacy code because it's legacy code because you didn't write it. It's written by somebody else. It doesn't quite work or doesn't quite do what you need it to do. But now you've got to fix it. And you and this often happens sometime, you know, we we pushed the code into production, but we didn't test. And now next week, I've got to fix a problem. But I thought the code looked OK. And the problem is we're already seeing this happening. And we're seeing it happening in a number of cases. I think one of my favorite ones is Bertram Meyer actually published an article earlier in the year where he talked about getting in a solution from AI um, and uh, to a very simple problem. And he said it looks plausible in this, but there's a, there's a bug. And then he chose another solution. Uh, and he asked the question differently and it generated and he was satisfied with it. There's only one problem. It didn't work, but he didn't test. He just thought it, it looks and feels right or it looks complicated enough that it's probably right. You have this so little funny filter cut off. You, you probably so, have mixed feelings about generating uh, unit tests with AI, which I, I've seen. As like typically, a, yeah, yeah. Because because uh, again, I, I tend to ask when I... When I so I, I had an interesting experience. It wasn't with C++ uh, earlier this year. Was, I, I did some stuff with Kotlin, um, but I'm not a Kotlin programmer. But I thought, you know what, I'll ask I'll ask uh, ChatGPT. Um, uh, I've also since asked Bard and gave me it gave me a much more working solution at that point. Uh, but ChatGPT, I asked it the solution and it gave me something that was idiomatic Kotlin. And it was absolutely brilliant. There's only one problem is it completely hallucinated the functions that I needed. Um, and then he eventually gave me a solution when I pointed this one out and that solution again looked plausible except for one thing it didn't produce the right answer fortunately I had tests to spot that it did all the mechanics it did all the movement you had the loops and all the rest of it but it didn't produce the right answer and then the next time so in other words you need to consider when you look at it from the point of view of AI you need to consider there's a conversation it's not generating code for you it's not a straight through process. It's not a formal transformation. It's a conversation. What about this? What about that? Let me just check that for you. Okay, that's not quite what I was after. Or I'll take what you got and then I'll adapt it. Um, but there's a human in the loop and there's tests in the loop. Now, when we start saying, let's generate unit tests for that, it's like, well, tell me what you mean by that. Are you going to tell me that you're going to get something to generate you both the code and from the same words and specifications, going to generate the say it's going to generate tests. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, first of all, it's not going to run them. It's going to leave it to you because these are not running them. That's an important thing. They um, 
that's a, that's a solvable problem, by the way. They can do that, um, and they can learn from that. But at the moment, that's not really that's not really what's happening. But there has to be something in the loop that asks the question a different way. And there has to be something that applies judgment and goes, oh, wait a minute, I understand the ambiguity in what I asked. The problem's with me, or actually the problem's with you, you're hallucinating. That's that's where the human is going to be important, because otherwise we're going to be generating code that other people wrote. We already have that problem. <laughs> so in other words, that's we, we've already got that problem. The idea of multiplying it and creating a huge legacy debt is a problem. Uh, I'm perhaps a little more interested in seeing AI on the refactoring side. Take this code, refactor it into something cleaner, and then I already know what I'm expecting, and I can write the tests against that. And now we've got rid of the problem of legacy code. But if the problem that we have is create, if, if we start using AI to create new legacy code, I think, uh, and there's a lot of people that are doing that and have done that and will do that, I think it's that's going to be a problem. Yeah, it's fast. It looks like you're getting results. But the, what's going to distinguish the top programmers um, from the rest is those are the top programmers who know what they want and know how to get it and know there's a dialogue and they are going to potentially, they're going to get some really good stuff. So I think it's going to widen the gap but in terms of software developers, um, in terms of uh, uh, potentially the skills or capabilities uh, that people adopt. Right. I've seen your experiment with Scotland, and yeah. it's, it's rather interesting that basically, you know, you, you get to to the point where you have code that you can put on a slide, and most people in the audience will believe that Kevin Henney or, you know, anyone else could present this slide, and people would read through it and say, oh, of course, that's how you do it in Scotland. And then, well, actually, no, uh, that's completely hallucinated. And yeah. I think that's a huge problem with uh, which a lot of people still need to start understanding that those systems um, are not truthful and do not have any idea of yeah. uh, wrong or, or true or false. Yeah. Um, they have the, the, I mean, there's, there's a bigger discussion here, which I don't think we have the time for, yeah. but there's, there's understanding what is the nature of such software and that, idea i think is going to be um uh, i think there are certain things that can be improved and will improve but there's also something else that is fundamentally missing that still requires a human in the loop um and i think that is going to be you know you are left with the same problem how do i specify what i want okay that requires precision and that is Sometimes people call that computational thinking. It's not about the curly brackets. It's about being able to say that I want this with this and being absolutely precise and then knowing what you've got, um, that there is a skill in that space. And if you don't have that, you're constantly going to be chasing broken things. Um, you'll look very busy. And in some ways, you might even look productive. But I I, I think that there is a um, uh, there are going to be some issues with that. I would also be interested in, the role of AI from the point of view, um, there was a question, the question was phrased also, by the way, with specific, uh, specifically with respect to C++, let's go right back to where we started and also talking about CPP2, um, the complexity of C++. What you kind of want is a you know, static analysis, but at a, a, at a richer level. Potentially, it's that, let me not just offer things to um, uh, AI and say, hey, generate me this. Is I've got some C plus plus. Can you see anything wrong with this? Or you know, what are the memory? What are the potential memory issues here? Or you know, th these kinds of things. Tell me about this from a security point of view. Let's turn this around, um, and not think of it just as generator, but as reviewer. I think there's potential. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. you know, so I think yeah. there's a lot of things that it's very easy to fall into the generation idea as being of that's what we're going to get. It's like actually no, there's a number of issues with that. Not all of which are um, going to be problems forever. There are, but there are still a number of issues, but maybe we're missing some of the point. Maybe, maybe there's a lot more that we can use, um, something that has been trained on a vast body of code um, that can potentially offer us. And again, I want to go back to this idea of conversation. It, it's a, you know, that, that idea, it's a dialogue. If you start looking like that, I think you're more likely to get good results. All right. And to kind of close 